the next issue this week, and I'll say issue, it's actually an article that you wrote, Tom, um, called Nostalgia. Um, brilliant article in terms of your reminiscing of the days of the 1970s. Um, and, and obviously you, you talk about how you're watching the um, sort of big match replayed on a Saturday morning um, and the football that took place then, the footballers that existed and the sort of the culture existed. Um, and then you, and I'll pass it over to you in a second, obviously, and, you, and then you bring it forward to the present day and your social media interaction and how, I suppose, it, as a conclusion, not an awful lot has changed. Um, should, we start no. by, should we start by talking about the football, though? Just for two yes, minutes. But I, <laughs> I, absolutely, I can always talk about football, uh, and that would be a pleasure. <laughs> but um, I, 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 um, I posted the, um, the article on my social media with, with the sort of uh, intro saying, this is not an article about football, this is actually about no. politics. OK, there's a bit of football in there. But actually, it's a it's a commentary about modern political discourse, etc. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I grew up as a small child in the seventies, football mad, um, you know, w watching every watching and playing football constantly. Uh, watched a lot of the big match back then, um, and now there's the big match revisited being shown on 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 Saturdays, replays of those shows, and watching those old games and having waves of nostalgia flooding over me watching those amazing players from that era where I grew up. Even and there's old voices as well. There. And mm -hmm. the old voices as well. Brian Moore, Martin yeah. Tyler in his very early days, Gerald Sinstad, you know, yeah. it, you know, yeah. you think, you know, obviously Martin Tyler is now, you know, numero uno at, at Sky Sports. And, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's quite surreal, isn't it? Looking back over it. Um, and also, I, I pick up as well, if you remember on Brian Moore, you used to have these certain uh, commentary ticks. Do you ever notice? Mm -hmm. He'd always say, what a good shot there. What a good goal there. <laughs> Do you know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> and you pick up on it more, obviously, as you're older and you look back. Absolutely, yeah. He did end, end sentences with there all the time. Yeah. Uh, it's like, yeah, I was watching it too. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's funny. Um, but yes, I mean, uh, and, and I mentioned in the article, you know, it's, it's also kind of amusing as well as nostalgic to, to see some of the things from back in the 70s that are so different now in today's modern day. I mean, the pitches for a start, mud baths or, or, and or covered in sand, pitches covered in sand because of, you know, waterlogging and, and mud, uh, just atrocious, atrocious pitches that I think today's modern players probably couldn't, couldn't perform very well on. Um, and given how bad the pitches were, some of the players actually their touches uh, was ex you know exceptional. Um, you know, goal some goalkeepers not even wearing gloves, just bare hands. Uh, of course, back passes where that they can pick up, uh, and um, and certainly some agricultural tackling. <laughs> it's interesting because um, one of the um, theories put forward to why Liverpool were successful, su successful, I should say. <laughs> During the 1970s and 1980s, up until the point where the back pass, pass rule was was outlawed, if I get my words out properly, outlawed, um, was the fact that there are some people calculated that between a third and a quarter of the game, the ball was in Ray Clements's hands. <laughs> so Doug Leash or Rush would put them one nil up, and then Ray Clements would see most of the ball. <laughs> well, the keeper did used to be able to, you know, hold on to the ball for for a lot longer, and they did that, you know, they. They'd pick up back passes and then they'd bounce it or roll it and then pick it up again, which nowadays they're not allowed to do and uh, and things like that. So, yeah, there was a lot of uh, essentially wasted time. Mm. It, it wasn't officially time wasting then, but it was wasted time. Um, and and some uh, I certainly think things like the, the back pass rule where keepers can't, can't pick it up with their hands has been a, a, a good thing for the game. Yes, very much so. Um, well, one thing I noticed, wonderful I think... to see see some of those old, wonderful, skillful players. You know, Tony Curry, Stan Bowles, my my boyhood hero, Trevor Francis, young Ray Wilkins, young Glenn Hoddle. Uh, you know, I particularly love those those midfielders. There was Vince Hilaire for Palace, and it's funny because uh, you, you say know, Vince. So many fabulous players. When you mentioned Vince Hilaire, they asked, oh, I've forgotten all about him. Obviously, playing for Crystal Palace. I mean, with Trevor Francis, I remember in 1978. Birmingham play came down here to play a friendly with Weymouth and, and Trevor Francis scored both the goals. Um, 
And of course, you know, like you also mentioned people like Laurie Cunningham, who tragically died in a car crash in the late 1980s. Um, but he was on loan at, at United, and obviously he was a huge at West Bromwich Albion um, in the late 1970s. But one thing I'm really interested to talk about moving on, Tom, um, is the homophobia and the racism and the sexism that was on the terraces in the 1970s. And it almost, I think you sort of imply it in some way, is it's now moved onto social media because it's been banned from the terraces. Um, so people are still doing it. They just found somewhere else to do it. Absolutely right. And, and that was really the point of my article, apart from waxing lyrical and, and nost nostalgically about, <laughs> about football of my youth. But, um, but it struck me that, uh, you know, as I say in the article, I, I spend too much time on political discussion groups on social media, particularly on Facebook, much against my better judgment. And uh, there are, you know, there are a lot of people of all different political persuasions, but I find that there's a lot of people with right wing views, most of which are sort of imported from America, again, from the alt right and, and political right wing political commentators uh, in America. And uh, and people seem to think it's fine on social media to say blatantly racist, sexist, homophobic thing. It just struck me that a lot of the people I'm interacting with on social media are, are stuck in the 70s, you know, and they probably want to, they, they probably long for a time where they, um, you know, can, can speak race, can say racist and sexist things with impunity and homophobic things with impunity, where they can, um, uh, you know, watch Bernard Manning or, or Jim Davidson say uh, deliver what was known as you know kind of racist comedy it wasn't comedy it was just racism mm -hmm. and um and they you know and and mostly men as they are they you know want their dinner on the table at six or expect that so um you know th that seems to be a lot of the a lot of the um sort of attitudes I, I just think wow these people are kind of stuck in the 70s um, and so, yeah, not, not, as I said, nostalgia is uh, not, not what it used to be. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's interesting, Jase, that, you know, some of those, it's fascinating how a lot of the, that political discussion on the, the, of right-wing supporters, conservative supporters in the UK on social media now is absolutely all from, all from America. The points they're making, the arguments they're saying, the content that they're sharing. I mean, you know, they're sharing, to, um, you know, things from from Turning Point, you know, this very uh, right wing American organization that's infiltrated our universities now. Um, uh, they're sharing memes from America, speakers from America, alt right and pro Trump talkers, uh, you know, people like Candace Owens from, from Turning yes. Point, Jordan Peterson, Ben Shapiro. You know, those are the kind of people that our, our people in the UK are sharing. They're all American right wing. Uh, pro-Trump supporters um, and it, it just seems bizarre to me that they you know that they share those things and also there's a nastiness to a lot of it one of the big things in America is that that, that right-wing people love to what's known as own of the libs they want to own the liberals um, by putting them down by supposedly exposing them uh, you know the, their arguments and uh, so there's, yeah, there's lots of content in America that's posted all about how, how we owned the libs today. And, and again, that's been imported here. Somebody on a, on a political discussion group the other day said that uh, after the elections, they were thirsty for lefty tears. They were thirsty for lefty tears. Like, what, what on earth kind of language and political dis discourse is that? Um, so, yeah, and, and it's sadly, almost. <laughs> It's almost yeah. poetic, isn't it? It's not something you, you even expect, unfortunately, from no disrespect, but it's you know, from from the right wing who tend to be much more uh, ad hominem and much more blunt. They don't really care about people's emotions and, and how how people respond to what they say. But that is almost poetic. <laughs> well, it, thirsty for lefty toy tears is kind of almost. Per poetic except that it's incredibly nasty unpleasant oh, of course it is in, in its, oh, in its meaning yes. um you know in its meaning it's 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 pretty awful and um and of course what we've what i've noticed a lot and i know this is from my point of view which is obviously a left-wing point of view but a, a, a huge amount of the discussions which i've read or participated tend to be where left-wing people i i believe i find 
tend to post more factual information, literally facts and truth, and people on the right completely ignore those facts and post propaganda and things that are not in any way factual. And, and they just ignore and dismiss the facts that you present them with, you know, such as facts about levels of poverty that exist um, in this country, levels of charge with poverty, facts about the national debt, which of course doubled under the Conservatives prior to the pandemic, uh, etc. You know, you post things like that and they, they just, um, uh, you know, ig ignore it, say mm -hmm. that you're posting things that are biased or, or whatever, um, and post some some ridiculous propaganda in, in response. So, um, and on top of which, as I say, there's a lot of racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia. So yeah, I think a lot of people stuck in the 70s still. Just, just to finish off before we move on to the next topic, do you think though that, obviously nostalgia is very much in terms of somebody growing older and then looking back, and one of the things that you know often accuse people who spend a lot of time looking back is this idea of the sort of the rose-tinted glasses that things were better back then. I think the point your article was effectively saying is that then and now are the same, but it's just portrayed. It's it's just allowed to um, come to the surface in different ways. Um, so, you know, as, as, as I said before, you know, the racism, the sexism, the homophobia, the misogyny, all of those things, absolutely integral to the 1970s. Um, but people were screaming at, you know, black footballers, they were calling them puffs and all that sort of stuff. Because they can't do it anymore on the terraces, or if they are, they're, you know, ejected from the stadiums or whatever. Now, they're on social media. And I think as we talked about last week with, with Facebook and Trump, it, it's time that the big tech companies did the same thing as the stewards. They eject them off social media. Um, yeah. And of course, before we now move on to the next topic, we're still waiting for that, aren't we? We're still waiting yeah. for society to say, no, we're not, we're not accepting that anymore. And you know, yeah. these people finding themselves in court, People that set these people find themselves with lifetime bans, yeah. not just from the team that they support, but from any stadium. Yeah, and maybe that's the way to use ID, not not in terms of, <laughs> but in terms of preventing people who genuinely uh, just are a big boil of hate to be sidelined and, and maybe help them. Society step in and help them to understand why their anger and their aggression is is undermining other people's life experiences. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you're exactly right that, you know, that those prejudices have remained, but people uh, are aware that it's, it's um, you know, uh, it, it's it's not deemed at all appropriate to, uh, to be vocal at, you know, actually in public at football matches or wherever, although some people, of course, still are. But there's less of that than in the 70s, but it, it's moved online. And of course, we've seen just in the last week, we've seen not just footballers and football clubs, but loads of different sporting athletes uh, and organisations across the world taking a stand against racism and prejudice and, and coming off, off social media um, yes. for a period of time. Some are doing it for a week, some are doing it for longer. Um, Thierry Henry, I think, has said he's, he's, he's doing it forever now. He's, he's not returning um, and taking a stand. But I think, you know, that there's... The, the abuse, the levels of abuse that particularly black players um, uh, receive is, is just appalling. And uh, it, it staggers me that, uh, that clubs, football association, football clubs, tech companies and the police aren't able to deal with it. To me, it seems obvious. Somebody sends an abusive racist tweet to a player or, or social media post to a player. Surely the police and the tech companies between them have the ability to identify who that person is that sent it, and and you go and arrest them, charge them, have them in court, ban them from football forever, uh, and and see some of them go to prison, um, and uh, you know for for uh, inciting racial hatred or for uh, electronic communications uh, law, laws that they've broken, etc. Uh, surely the, we, we're able to do that, and if the funding isn't there to uh, free up police police time to do that, 
then you know the big clubs need to chip in a couple of million each, get a fund together, employ some police or ex-police officers into a unit that that sorts this out. And it you know I, it staggers me that that uh, you know players are suffering with this. It's it's really awful. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure again, like many other things, we'll we'll come back to this 